Un tiem cienījumiem ieslēgcīs dalībnieki, Mārs sāks Lolija Tozoliņa. Es esmu Latvijas Kultūras akadēmijas doktorante, un man ir liels prieks un lūdzu atklāt startups semināru ciklu valsts pētību programmas Letonieku Latvijas un Eiropijas sagiedības attīstībā ir projekta identā šainās vērsturi kultūru vide ietvaras. Projekts ir īstenots piedaloties pieciem partneriem – vadošais partneris Latvijas universitātes, Likartūras folkloras un mākslas institūtes, Rezernes tehnoloģija akadēmija, Liepājas universitāte un mākslas akadēmija. Projekta mērķis ir īstenot daudzmensālu un spēknozāru pētījumu par identitātes vārstus. Vārstus un mūsdienu kontekstus. Un tieši šodien man ir prieks un godas aicināt uz jūs visu aicināt šo lekciju, kuru vadījis vairāk rāma tautos, jūsdienošās etnoloģijas profesors Ulds Kopēks. Šodienas lekcijā viņš stāstīs par Eiropas Dievai Vairāvām, to pamatīt un reizināt attiecībā par tām vietas saknē un vietas izjūtu zināšanu etnoloģiju perspektīvā iesicējo ģeopoēģijas un topoloģijas sasaisti ar identitātes pētījumiem. Vārdu profesoram es vēlos arī pieteikt, ka lekcija būs aptuveni 45 minūtes dara, Un pēc tā maicina iesaistīties visus lekcijas dalībnieks diskusijā, uzbūdot jautājumus, komentējot lekcijas gaitā dzirdēto saturu. Un jautājums noteikti var tiesūtīt gan čatiņā vai diskusiju logā, kā arī noteikti uzdot pēc lekcijas sakrājušos jautājumus un aicināt arī iesaistīties diskusijā. But now I give the floor to the professor to start the lecture and please join us today for this very, very special moment, a special lecture. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to be asked to give the first of these lectures in connection with your new research program. I had quite a bit of thinking to do when you asked me and in terms of finding a topic that would be suitable. And I thought an, an overview uh, of some of my current thinking, recent thinking might be quite useful and basing that on a book that I'm reading at the moment, which gave me the title for the, the talk. And I'll explain that in, in a moment. Uh, this idea of the fundamental field comes, comes from a collaboration between two people that uh, I'm, I'm reading at the moment again and uh, reading some of their new work as well. So uh, what, what did I promise to say? As I, I said I would be drawing on critical reading of continental philosophy through an exchange between two people, in particular Kenneth White, who represents geopoetics, and Jeff Malpass, who is actually an Australian, uh, who represents the approach of topology, the knowledge of place, topos and logos. Um, and so I, I promised to explore human ecological relationships in the landscapes of the European North. Uh, and I probably have to define what the North is in a minute. Uh, and looking at indigenous life worlds and the experiences of people who are no longer indigenous to place. And um, I'm beginning to share by slides now if I can, uh, if that works. Okay, there we go. So uh, I also promised to look at this from both in emic and etic ethnological perspectives. And um, that's something that maybe we'll have to postpone until the question and answers, because there's only so much you can do in the space of a, a lecture. Um, but in particular, what I wanted to look at, and this is an issue that is a big issue in, in Scotland at the moment, the discussion around becoming indigenous. Can one become rooted to a place one is not from in any meaningful sense? And for that, I'm also partly looking to the work of a, a farmer, rancher, and anthropologist, Keith Basso, who lives in Arizona, and wrote a very famous book some years ago called Wisdom Sits in Places. And I'll come back to that later on in the talk. Uh, but this kind of wisdom that sits in places can inspire and, and guide land-based learning. Uh, this is something that we're quite actively involved in in the Scottish context. 
so I'll talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, and I'll use some examples from Scotland and what I said in the abstract was the Baltic region. Uh, the uh, examples are mainly from, or oh, exclusively from uh, Lithuania on this occasion, but that had practical reasons. So let's just move on. That doesn't. Uh, okay. So bear with me when I'm trying to move the, oh yeah, good. The slides onward. So north, I mean, those regions that I mentioned, Scotland and the Baltic are not normally subsumed under the idea of north. And if it's reference to the European north that brought you here today, and you expect to hear about Sami reindeer herders and Icelandic whalers, uh, then you would probably be disappointed. But Scotland and the Baltic states arguably do belong to the European north. Edinburgh lies further north than Copenhagen, which everybody agrees is in Northern Europe. Uh, and Lerick on Shetland lies further north than Maria Hown on the Orland Islands. And Riga lies somewhere in between, so the east is also the north. And in fact, that's how we treat and look at the north in the Institute for Northern Studies, where I work at the moment at the University of the Highlands and Islands. We are an interdisciplinary research center with um, campuses in Kirkwall and Orkney, uh, Lerick and Shetland, uh, and the third one in the heart of the Scottish mainland in Perth. Um, and our aim as an institute is to preserve, rediscover, and interpret the cultural heritage oh, yeah. of, hmm? oh, yeah. of, of Scotland. Uh, Nori, I think you have your uh, microphone on. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so our aim is to preserve and rediscover and interpret the cultural heritage of Scotland and the wider northern world to the benefit of local communities and working closely with local communities. So over the years, and before I joined the University of the Highlands and Islands, uh, I've looked at issues of place and landscape and belonging in a variety of political contexts across Europe and with the focus over the last decade in particular, uh, being largely on Scotland, oh, yeah. Lithuania, and the Central oh, Europe, with a theoretical perspective that was shaped by topology and geopoetics. And I see if I can get this to move on again. Yo, good, topology. So in his book on entitled Heidegger's Topology, Jeff Malpass, uh, who I mentioned earlier, argues that an engagement with place explicit in Heidegger's later work informs the entire thought of the philosopher Heidegger. And what guides Heidegger's thinking, says Malpass, is a conception of philosophy, uh, the starting point of philosophical inquiry, as being the fact that we're finding ourselves already there, situated in the world, in place, so to speak. So we, we, we find ourselves uh, thrown, a big word in Heidegger's philosophy. Um, and Heidegger's concepts of being and place, Malpass argues, are in, inextricably bound together. Um, Malpass then follows the development of, of Heidegger's topology, as he calls it, the knowledge of place, uh, through what he dis dis discerns as three stages of development. There's the early period uh, of the 1910s and 1920s, the writing of being and time, which centered on the meaning of being. The middle period, then in the 30s and into the 40s, which was centered around the truth of being, uh, being being and truth and the late period from the mid 40s onwards when the place of being became an uh, important consideration and focus. In the context of going through these phases, Malthus also challenges the, the widely repeated arguments that connect Heidegger's notion of place and belonging uh, to his entanglement with Nazism. And that's, that's a point that 
we need to, to bear in mind when we uh, work with this kind of philosophy. We might come back to that later in the talk. So the significance of, of Heidegger as a thinker of place, says Malpass, lies not only in the philosopher's own investigations per se, but also in the way that spatial and topographic thinking has flowed from Heidegger's work into that of a large number of other key thinkers over the past 60 years. And in a conversation I just said before this, this lecture started, um, I would say once again that it's, it's amazing when you look through various disciplines and, and the, the conceptual thinking about place and space and identity that goes on in these disciplines. It's, it's, it's really amazing how much of that to this very day um, and, and Heidegger is that nearly 50 years now, uh, but to this very day is influenced by uh, the thinking that he developed, developed regardless of any political associations, undertones and overtones. So one of the, the, the key thinkers over the past 60 years that has been influenced by Heidegger's philosophy is the poet Kenneth White who developed, among other things, uh, the figure of what he called the intellectual nomad. And this is the German version of his doctoral thesis, uh, apparently. Um, the intellectual nomad as someone who's free from cultural and scientific limitations and conventions and whose mind roams all areas of the earth uh, without a fixed goal but always in search of expanding his or her own knowledge and ability to know. Uh, the figure of this intellectual nomad appears, of course, as, as, is not an invention of Kenneth White's, but appears as early as at least the 19th century. They think, for example, of Arthur Rimbaud there, and uh, Kenneth White travels with this figure from the Celticism of the British Isles and Brittany, where he lives, uh, to the Far Eastern philosophies, from German Romanticism to Russian Nihilism, from Thoreau in the forests of America to Nietzsche in the Engadin and, and Heidegger, of course, in the Black Forest uh, in Southwest Germany. Uh, and he writes that in the intellectual nomad, erudition and wandering mix come together. Um, but this wandering around is fruitful and invigorating for the civilization weary intellect uh, and uh, he continues to say, if we try to continue in thought uh, and not to forget that the outermost deepest thinking may not be realized in philosophical discourse, but in the exact or extravagant language of a poem, we try to preserve the possibility for the mind to inhabit the earth in a more free thinking way. Now, that sounds beautifully nice and abstract, but anyway, we try and bring that uh, in connection with uh, the topic for, for today. And this arose out of an exchange that um, Malpass and Heidegger had when they sent each other uh, samples of each other's books and, and essays, and having read some of each other's work already. And then they got together for a number of weeks in Brittany, in, in Kenneth White's house, um, where they exchanged views and had discussions. And then they wrote up a book in three parts, which is the first part is by Kenneth White, the second part by Jeff Malpass, uh, and the third part then is, is a, a poetic response uh, by Kenneth White. And this book, The Fundamental Field, uh, Thought, Poetics and World, is, is what, what gave me the inspiration for the title for today. Um, so in, in the wake of the poet Hölderlin's famous exclamation, what you want is a world, Heidegger, uh, who's an important reference point for both Malpass and White, speaks of the worlding of the world, das Welten der Welt, and he makes statements um, such as the world never is, it is always becoming, which is a very poor translation of the German, die Welt ist nie, sondern weltet, the world is worlding, the world is, is not, is, it never is, it worlds. It worlds. Um, and in the fundament the idea of the fundamental field refers to this worlding, the continuous worlding of the world, and the insight that, as contemporary history indicates, that unless we get 
at something fundamental, dealing with questions of founding and grounding uh, of existence and belonging and identity. That world is going to become more and more beset by centristic fundamentalisms of various types, all of them equally destructive of life thought and of any kind of integrated existence. And that's the point I touched on earlier, and I will have to come back to, which is the, the use that is made of these discourses that we're dealing with when we talk about identity and place and belonging and so on. Uh, the use that is made of that, in particular by populist movements of all color, but particularly on the right. Uh, and one has to tread carefully there. So White says on this point uh, in the first part of the book, that what I see in this whole enterprise, which involves landscape, history, and culture, is an attempt while insisting on the significance of place, the necessity of emplacement, to get beyond anything like regional thematics, small-minded localism, Kuthi homeliness. Uh, if the heart is present, any dwelling in sentimentality is out. The accent is on the place of the mind, what he calls Geistige Heimat, the German phrase. And if there is a search for identity, it is a new identity that is, it takes place outside the search for roots. And he puts roots in inverted commas, and that indicates, of course, that what he's talking about here is an ideological concept of, of roots and rooting, rather than an, an actual connection with roots. And that, that's one of the philosophical, methodological, analytical problems that I'm grappling with in, in, in some, if not all, of my more empirical work, I'm trying to understand how that works. And uh, some years ago, I, I started writing about this idea of becoming indigenous. And so, in other words, throwing down roots in the place where you don't have any. And how does that work? And, and what does that actually mean? And that is tied into this idea of new identity. And we have, actually have the phrase in Scotland at the political level and in political and social discourse of the new Scots, um, people who are coming into Scotland, either from England or from further afield, uh, and who are in one way or another throwing down roots in urban, in rural environments. How does that work in, in practice? And um, what emerges there is, is a new identity that isn't tied up and, and uh, hostage to older, ideas of rooting in place, uh, flood and soil kind of belongings, as it were. Um, I don't know if this is dwarf, but anyway. Um, so it's, it's not roots in the traditional sense that, that we're concerned with. It's roots in a different sense, in the sense of new identities. Um, and of course, roots relates to or comes from, connects with the um, the radix in Latin, uh, radical. Uh, you're going to, you're coming from the roots. That's what the term radical indicates. Um, and there has been over the, the last few years, the development of an approach called radical human ecology, which is the study and practice of relationships between the natural and social environment. And that has gained some prominence as scholars seek more efficiently and effectively to engage with the pressing global concerns over the, uh, over the past 70 years or so, most human ecology approaches have skirted the fringes of geography, sociology and biology, and have usually sat in one or other of these departments in terms of university, organization, institutional alignment. Radical human ecology explores the power of indigenous and traditional people's epistemology. So it moves outside of the traditional academy as we know it, at least in the European context, both to critique and to, to complement insights from modernity and post-modernity, such as those of the philosopher Ernst Bloch, who in his magnum opus, as Prinzip Hoffnung, the principle of hope, he talks about in Umbau der Welt zur Heimat, the transformation of the world into home. Um, so this is kind of a forward projection, whereas normally the discourse of Heimat in the German language world um, is very much a backward looking one, something that one has lost. 
seeks to recreate, recapture. Um, whereas to Bloch, the Heimat is something we have not yet had, uh, which shines into all our childhoods and where nobody has ever been, he says at the end of the book. So, in that sense, radical human ecology shows that an intercultural and transdisciplinary approach is required and that the demands of our era, era, the issues that we're dealing with all the way from local development to climate change require a scholarship of considerable ontological depth, an approach that cannot just debate issues but also addresses questions of practice and meaning at the same time. Now let's go from the level of the abstract, slide one or two steps down to the level of the real world and have a look across the highlands of Scotland. Now we could spend an entire lecture or possibly more to try and deconstruct this particular image, but we won't do that today. Um, the image as such is reminiscent of Caspar David Friedrich's Man in the Mountains that you may be familiar with. The guy is standing on top of a mountain gazing across a sea of clouds. Landscape as the sublime, landscape as the backdrop to what exactly is it the backdrop to? Now, where we see wild and untamed nature, we're actually looking at shaped reality that results from economic, social, political pressures pressures as interpreted largely by people in positions of power to affect such shaping. Uh, these, I'm questioning here in the way I'm talking about, I'm questioning the ontolog ontological status of these pressures when I say that they are pressures as interpreted by people in positions of power who then draw conclusions as to what has to be done about these pressures, uh, whether they're actually actual pressures that are there is another matter. Um, so they affect such shaping of the landscape, having first scoped the land's potential to, suit, to be suitably transformed. In places such as the, the Scottish Highlands, which this picture is taken from, that landscaping has forced many people from the land of their ancestors, forcing them to escape to new landscape, the new landscape that was being created. And now that very desert that was created by the clearances of the 19th century has become a tourist attraction and therefore it has become not simply a devastated landscape, but a resource for development after a fashion. And, and that transient land use very often stands in the way of other more sustainable forms of development that would support local communities conceivably much better. Um, and the continued pursuit of this particular land use lays a kind of a veneer across over the land that, that blocks a deeper connection of humans to place in, in all its layers. So issues of, of place and landscape and belonging have been critically examined from two distinct perspectives in different yet often confused political contexts. Uh, and international organizations like UNESCO often find themselves caught in between the two. Uh, that there is the key trope of indigeneity that remains quite controversial. On the one hand, it designates a colonized people, peoples, the plural, living both in and out of place, in particular by contrast with their colonizers. Now, that distinction can be quite complex. Now, to the European settlers coming to America, the Hopi and the Navajo are both Native Americans. But when you talk to them as separate people individually, uh, the, the Hopi are quite clear that they grew from the soil, so they're, they're autochthonous, uh, whereas the Navajo came later into the area and only then became indigenous to the area. 
So it's, it's not a simple black and white distinction between the colonizers and the colonized here either. But on the other hand, we have the use of uh, the, the trope of indigeneity, uh, which has and historically has been claimed and still is in many cases as a key batch of identity by populist movements of various political orientation, left and right, but primarily actually on the right, uh, even if it goes down to a con uh, con concept and discourse of we were here first. Okay, we acknowledge we are incomers too, but we were here first. So we have older rights than the new comers, the new arrivals. The third aspect of, of uh, this problematic is the, the growing association of indigeneity, ideas of indigeneity um, with picturesque cultural fixations furthered by factors that can range from the internal exotic, but Bausinger calls had been an exotic many years ago, stereotypes of, of a, an internal exotic to well-meaning, well-intended measures of cultural protection like the various uh, UNESCO designations of heritage, especially ICH, intangible cultural heritage. Now, some international networks, for example, the Alliance for Intergenerational Resilience that I posted on the slide here have begun to address the tensions and contradictions that arise from all of this. And they're trying to explore what indigeneity means in different places and at different times and for different constituencies. How it is expressed by whom? Um, in that context, significant and most challenging is in this endeavor is the question of legitimacy. Uh, whose indigeneity is it? Uh, on what grounds is such indigeneity founded? Whose world is worlding in, in this process that we're looking at here? Now, the answers are complicated by the history of displacement in terms of both physical and metaphorical movement of people out of their place and out of their place of belonging. Whether we're uh, dealing with mass flight and expulsion as we're seeing it at the moment again in Ukraine and as happened after violent conflicts, uh, for example, the Second World War, um, whether we're dealing with rural urban migration within and across various boundaries, national, international, regional, uh, or the internal exile of various description. There are a large number of people nowadays who live in some form of diaspora, literally in the other, in, in the wrong place. Um, in academia, we're quite well used to analytical discourses that sometimes euphemize this to a greater or lesser extent with the employment of phrases like cosmopolitanism or transnationalism, um, which gloss over the fundamental disconnect that affects many displaced people, whether their trauma finds immediate discernible expression or remains largely hidden in their subconscious until surfacing in response to some external or internal impulse. There's now a growing body of research on the effects of such trauma into later generations who did not experience it directly, but who are still suffering from it, which indicates that relationships between people and place and the impacts of having such relationships severed is still very poorly understood by our Western science. And I suppose this is where the indigenous models come back in and this, this realization that we not fully understand what has been, what is going on in that regard, that realization has led to a growing interest in both indigenous methods of understanding the world and in ways of potentially becoming indigenous. And it's needless to say in that context that the latter is particularly strong among non-indigenous peoples and this has produced debates that on the one hand are necessary and generally helpful, but are also often 
acrimonious and sometimes ridiculous. Uh, they often center on language as a suitably non-racial and therefore by definition non-racist criterion. But as soon as somebody puts the term place into the vocabulary of the debate, immediately the specter of blood and soil ideologies is being invoked as we've seen recently in, in a very fiery debate in, in Scotland over the, the Gaeltacht and, and who is Gaelic, who, who's a Gael, um, who belongs and who doesn't belong and why and why not. Um, and it's, it's quite an interesting uh, exchange of views, if one wants to put it like that, that went on in the pages of the journal Scottish Affairs over Christmas, well, just before Christmas and uh, early in the new year. Of course, the, the populist use of indigeneity quite rightly sounds alarm bells. Um, it would be misleading to tar all references to the land, to grounding and so on with the broad fascism brush. But it doesn't help in that context in the, in the defense of the argument, so to speak, that the philosopher who has been the most influential on thinking about these issues has been a certain Martin Heidegger with his jargon of authenticity, Theodore Adorno. Um, but that is a challenge that those who draw on his work will have to face and live with and respond to. And I'm sure we might be talking about that later. Most of us use the term sense of place often and rather carelessly when we think of nature or home or literature. And our senses of place come not only from our individual experiences, but also from our cultures, the, environment, the cultural environment and embedding that we experience and grow up in. In, in his book, Wisdom Sits in Places, Keith Basil, uh, who is, uh, describes himself as a rancher first, a farmer first, and an academic second, uh, explores place, places, landscape, and language, and what they mean to a particular group of people that he's closely involved with, the Western Apache in Arizona. But the book does more than that, and it gives us an understanding of, of something about the sacred and the indivisible nature of words and place, words and place belonging together. Uh, and this is kind of a, a universal recognition that Scott Mamaday, the American, in the Native American writer has put it like this. He says, place may be the first of all concepts. It may be the oldest of all words. And that's something to worth thinking about um, place as one of our, our very, possibly one of the oldest concepts and words that we use in any culture. Uh, and in that sense, Basel is the veil on the most elemental poetry of human experience, which is the naming of the world. And, and there we have a touching point between uh, what Basel talks about and, and what, what Kenneth White is, is getting at uh, in terms of writing a world and, and all of that. Uh, through Basso's perspective, we glimpse the spirit of a remarkable people in their land. But also when we look away from that particular case study, what we see, we see our own world possibly refreshed and with new eyes. Now, the Alliance for Intergenerational Resilience that I mentioned earlier is one of the organizations that is involved in the land-based learning, uh, land-based pedagogy in support of sustainable communities. And another organization involved in that is Learning for Sustainability Scotland. Uh, and I wear either hat on occasion, being involved with the steering groups of both. Um, so what is land-based learning in this context all about? It's primarily about understanding who we are and where we come from. Um, one of the, the key tenets of that approach is that every culture is connected to its environment. There's no culture out with or outside of an environment. Uh, and some people even reject the idea of environment because that kind of puts a dividing line between us and 
all that out there uh, and prefer the term ecology. And this is the radical human ecology approach uh, that talks about ecological relationships rather than human, human being here, environment there kind of uh, representations. Um, arguably, indigenous cultures have lived off the land for centuries, have lived in close association with the land and developed a traditional knowledge and knowledges and rooted connections to the land. Now go back to the term root, of course, that uh, kind of I challenged earlier in the context of the talking new identities, not, uh, not the old style rooting um, that a different ideology had, had furthered and, and, and promoted. Now the connections with, with place are at least twofold. There are physical connections and there are spiritual connections. On the physical side, cultures have traditional ways of using land and what is on it, uh, using the land to make things like shelter, tools, uh, anything that aids the task for living. This quite importantly, in terms of the human relationship with the land, there is diet, there's the traditional diet that includes immense knowledge of plants, animals and their various properties. Uh, there are traditional stories that pass on such knowledge of ecological connections to future generations that pass on the significance of symbols that connect the culture to the land. Um, and by observing the land and how it speaks to us, with us, cultures have learned how to move with and respect it. And this is a sense that um, we seem to have lost largely, partly by urbanization, but not only by urbanization, displacement plays a role there and various other factors. And then there's the, the spiritual connection, um, the connection through the imagination, as one might say from a different perspective, where indigenous cultures have a common belief that the earth is alive and that all things are related, connected somehow. Not that everything is connected to everything, but everything is connected to something. So the respect that these cultures teach us to show is the spirit we give to all things, things broadly defined. And when we acknowledge their spirit, um, when we communicate with that spirit and respect it, it becomes alive. And I always think uh, of a, a wonderful little anecdote that um, Peter Nabokov, the uh, Native American art historian, who's also working or used to work in Arizona, uh, has, has in, in one of his books called When Lightning Strikes. And he talks about this conversation he had with a, a native elder uh, about the rocks that were surrounding them. And he said, are you seriously saying that all of these rocks are animate? And the elder says, no, but some are. Uh, and this is in the context of a conversation about the responsibility for and, and respect towards the creation around us the things, the beings around us. And we don't know which of the rocks are animate, so we treat them all with respect. Um, so culture teaches how to communicate with all things in the broadest sense, including the land. And before we can see how a relationship with the land is fostered, we must, however, understand culture in a way that is encompassing of traditional knowledge and belief systems. Uh, and that's a big challenge. Now, at that point, I come to some of the examples, and uh, I just picked two from uh, Scotland and, and one and a half, really, from uh, Lithuania, although they're, well, they're two, but they're connected. Um, one of them is about, one could say, about the recovering of this kind of local environmental knowledge. Um, and it addresses the twin challenge of rural decline and depopulation, the, the loss of knowledge through those factors, uh, and urban alienation, the fact that the city dwellers become increasingly disconnected from, uh, even in the, in the first or second generation, from, from the experience of the land. And there is a place north of Aberdeen, no, not north of Aberdeen, north of Inverness, which is also north of Aberdeen, but Never mind the geography of Scotland, north of Inverness, there's a, a, a place in the mountains called the Shielding Project, which is a community enterprise that works with schools and teachers and local community uh, 
groups exploring the landscape's past and to help to shape a more resilient future, uh, ultimately preparing people for, well, you don't prepare an entire school class, but you, you might be, if you're lucky, inspire a, a handful of pupils in that class to reconnect uh, in a more durable, more, more, more continuous sense with the land and, and, and with the rural environment and maybe then resettle and repopulate and regenerate rural communities uh, in, in new ways. What's it all about? Well, we, we can learn a lot from the shielding tradition, which was a form of transhumance where uh, the um, livestock keeping farmers, um, smallholders would drive their cattle and other animals onto the summer grazing and uh, they had, they would live in little huts um, and uh, then in the winter would drive them back down into the, into the villages. So from that uh, tradition, you can learn a lot about history, livelihood, food, heritage, even issues of sustainability. Um, so in, in the past, each summer, young people would help to take the livestock up the hill to the shielding. They would camp out there in small bothies, as it were called, uh, and would learn about the world beyond the village. Today, you might learn about how to milk a cow, make butter and cheese, and the fact that milk, butter and cheese don't come from a factory, uh, originally at least. You might cut peats, you might do some weaving or dyeing of wool or rebuilding a hut, or so do something else creative in place, in, in the location. Uh, you also learn about the stories, songs and poems, the place names and what they encapsulate, what they embed. Uh, and from this rich traditional heritage, we understand the changing landscape and understand the skills that are needed to sustain our rural communities. Um, we've just, uh, in our institute, we've just got funding for a PhD on dry stone wallings, which we're quite excited to, looking forward to that. Dry stone walling as an ancient or traditional craft uh, in these rural communities that is all but forgotten now. Uh, and we're trying to help re regenerate, rejuvenate that. The second example I have is the, the Cataran uh, Echo Museum, and I refer to that as reading, reading the land in deep time. That's a way of telling a story and connecting to place and story. Echo museums are quite an interesting um, approach in, in, the, in this context, and there are various degrees and types of, uh, some are more like museums, and others are more like echo. Uh, the Catron Echo Museum is, is a wonderful creation. Um, they call themselves a museum without walls. All sites are outside. Uh, and they, they cover a huge historical range, uh, whereas in, in, in some examples of Echo Museums, you have like an example of a 19th century farming village. Um, and this approach is quite different. It, it takes the longitudinal approach, almost you could say a geological approach, which encompasses uh, the geology, but it encompasses Pictish stones, um, stories and legends of King Arthur and the Irish giant Finn McCool, contemporary histories of the Scottish traveling community, which has one of its the main bases uh, in the area, links, events linked to the Jacobite rebellions, and of course, the stories of, of Catarans themselves, who were the, the term Catarans refers to Highland clan warriors who, who came to be associated with cattle raiding. Um, and through that, you can, you can just, through exploring this Echo Museum territory, you, you can explore a, a continuous narrative and dip in and out. Uh, about not just the history of the place itself, but it projects further into uh, the, the history of Scotland and the connections of Scotland with the wider world. So it's part of the Scotland's network of long distance footpaths that take you through um, various interesting, illuminating locations. They also have a, an education project, obviously. Uh, they also have a resident, Makar, and Makar is a, a poet, 
um, in the more or less traditional way. But it's, again, it's, it's a, a different kind of approach, but also related to the shielding project in the way that it tries to rekindle people's connection with place, with, with land, by offering them a coherent narrative that embeds all the different strands from, as I said, from geology, through fable, through crafts, through buildings, through interesting bits and pieces of history. And, and does so in a very creative and innovative way. Um, okay, uh, moving over to the Baltic and the uh, Lithuania minor, as it were. I wasn't sure how to call it in English because there's so many names around it West Litauen, Klein Litauen. Um, Nameland, etc. Uh, so I, I did two projects over the last few years in the, the Maimeland in the West Litauen area. And uh, one of them was looking at the Coronian Spit as a World Heritage Site, as a, as a nature, uh, natural heritage, um, well, heritage site, heritage, more than one site, it, it's kind of a collection of sites. And um, we have there, of course, a big view, the great view that everybody knows about the Coronian Spit is the Great Dune, uh, which you can see from Nitten or Nida. Um, you see, see it behind there, behind the, the village, stretching out towards what is nowadays Kaliningrad Oblast, the part of the Russian Federation. Now the dune is a unique ecological, geological feature. It is a, a vulnerable landscape and seen by many as, as a, a natural landscape that needs to be protected. But what it actually is over the last 200 years or so, it has, has been humanly sculpted, or 300 years really. Uh, it is a highly managed landscape. Um, and in that sense, not a natural landscape at all. Um, so how does that, impact on our sense of place. And what does that mean for us? Um, of course, it is part of the area of German settlement that were cleared, for want of a better term, uh, at the end of the Second World War. So the original population, the German population was largely driven out um, or fled to Germany in the middle of the 1940s, or what was left of Germany. Uh, and quite a few of the remaining Lithuanian population was deported under the Stalinist deportations. So the, the area was virtually cleared of population and then new population came in, moved in um, and had to make its terms with the place. Now, even before that, and looking at the 1970s, um, there was the creation of an ethnographic graveyard, which is a very interesting concept. Um, a local artist living more or less across the road uh, witnessed the decline of the traditional ways of burial uh, memorials and creating burial grounds. And so he initiated this Coronian traditional a graveyard, which was partly a real graveyard and partly a work of landscape art. And apparently the Soviets bulldozed it a few times and, and it came back in the same way as the Hill of Crosses came back uh, near Shole. But it's, it, is, it is there today and, and it's kind of a tour, touristic site. And it, it still has some actual real graves there and some that are clearly sculptures, um, some more or less neglected. Um, it, the idea of it is, is, is quite interesting. And, and he had the inscription above the gate is in both German and Lithuanian. So it's a celebration of the joint, the shared heritage of sorts. And, and it, it raises interesting questions about the place, the sense of place, the placeness. Uh, whose landscape is this? And uh, 
Andy Pilates, Blake, who is a, uh, an anthropologist from Lithuania, has written quite interestingly about this split identity, locality, questions of belonging. Uh, more recently, you have the addition of Nida, Nida um, to the same trail of St. Jacob, the, the Camino, and I photographed this plaque on the outside of the Catholic Church in Nida, the new Catholic Church, and was interested that this is the, the Camino, the part of the route that is associated with, with and called the Pomeranian Jacobs Way. So the Pomeranian way of St. Jacob, but Pomerania is far to the west of West Lithuania. It's, it's the stretch between Gdansk, Danzig, and Chechen Stettin on, on the um, German Baltic coast. So it's quite interesting that uh, they don't develop a separate Camino connection, but they connect again with uh, a Camino part or stretch that is named after German association. So again, there's an identity belonging discourse going on here that raises interesting questions. Connected with that uh, in the city of Klaipeda, uh, the mainland more widely, this is my, was my second project where I was specifically looking at traces of the German past. The first project was about the, the World Heritage Site, the Koronian Spit, as a natural cultural heritage site. This was specifically looking at, at traces of the German past in, in Klaipeda today. Uh, and just to pick out a few examples, there's the Prussian military barracks, which you see bottom left, um, which nowadays houses the University of Klaipeda, as well as the German consulate. Um, so again, there's German heritage being reconnected with contemporary Germans. The city is saying something about its past and its and the place, as it were. Then we have a, an example on the top right um, of what heritage researchers call absent heritage. This is the, the church, the Protestant Lutheran Church of St. John's. Uh, there is no church there, but what happened locally is um, after independence, uh, the local initi and local initiative planted an outline of the church in, in box hedge, a, a box hedge that kind of follows, traces the outline of where the church would have been and where the, the bell tower, the spire would have been, you have the, the old bell which is the only thing that survives from the church. Uh, and at the end where the altar would have been, you have uh, a wooden cross, which you can't see here, um, that, that signifies uh, the, what the location of the high altar. There is uh, talk about at the moment uh, about rebuilding the, the church of St. John, but that's a bit of an ambivalent project in the sense that why would, one nowadays in a much more secularized society where people have stopped, especially on the Protestant uh, side, have stopped going to church that regularly. Why would one invest public money, which it would have, would to be, would have to be either government money or, or uh, uh, fundraising? Why would, why would one invest huge amounts of that money into recreating a building that would certainly not have its original use anymore? Uh, so what kind of statement would be made there if, if that were to happen? Uh, and then a very interesting uh, example of landscaping again, and it's a cemetery again. Uh, the German military cemetery, not far from the university now, uh, not far from the former barracks, which in the 50s was bulldozed by the Soviets. And after independence was recreated, not so much as a cemetery, cemetery per se, because after the bulldozing, nobody knows where the graves, where or where, where, where the corpus lays. It's all mangled up and to some extent lost. Um, but it was recreated as kind of a landscape park uh, that was clearly by these groups of three crosses uh, in among the trees, identified as a memorial for the dead. Um, and there's various structures to that, which, which I can't all put on, on, on the slide. Uh, 
that make this quite an interesting landscape. And what fascinated me most within that was this little set of gravestones, uh, which come from near Panevegis, which, which is in the north, in the middle of the north of Lithuania, quite a stretch away from Klaipeda. But these were, this is a site that was in its entire, in its entirety relocated from Panevegis. Uh, to this new memorial landscape. And these are all graves of First World War soldiers. And it included in among them, in among the way that they were buried, uh, there are two graves of Russian soldiers in among the German soldiers, which was quite an interesting observation too. And, and uh, this was relocated with support from the German um, association that looks after the, the German war graves in, in Europe. Uh, and they, they, some years ago, they, they sponsored the project of, of relocating this almost as an artwork within a piece of landscape art to this uh, memorial garden in Klaipeda. And again, there's a statement being made there, uh, not 100% sure what the statement is, but it shows a certain engagement with story of place and, and memory, belonging and rootedness in a way. So what we're dealing with in the mainland uh, is that we have largely a new population, new people that have, there are some people left from the previous population who were not driven out or deported, but by and large, the population of the mainland is relatively new um, in the place where they are. Uh, and they found interesting ways of, of, of dealing with the past, of dealing with the stories, dealing with the material reality uh, that they're uh, given, that they're, they're being thrown into in, in the Heidegger's terms. Um, but anyway, more questions to be raised uh, about that. Latvia, what about Latvia? I, I had hoped to um, include some examples from Latvia, but as of yet, I really don't know this country well enough to have done so. Um, and perhaps we can have an opportunity in the Q&A to explore some locations and issues, and I would quite appreciate that. Now, um, instead of a conclusion, because it's it's this isn't the kind of lecture that I've laid out in a way that would lead up to a conclusion and threads to be pulled together. But one could still say, well, what is it all about? What is it all for? What am I trying to, to get at with all this? And this is very much work in progress, even though it has been going on for some time and it has produced some written outputs already. Um, but some, some years ago, I uh, gave a lecture in the University of Innsbruck in Austria, um, where I argued for a reconfiguration of European ethnology in terms of the kind of subject matter and, and what kind of questions we ask and how we ask them. And I framed that at the time around the notion of topos, around the notion of, of place. And uh, this little diagram kind of summarizes the key, the key arguments there, but we're Dealing with in traditional ethnology uh, is really ethnography, the description, the deep description of, of place, and I call that the study, study of from hereness. Um, what makes uh, what makes us being from somewhere? And that was, was inspired by uh, the observation that there were people in the crazy, the um, the, the, the frontier, as it were, uh, which is nowadays Western Ukraine and Western Belarus, um, who between the wars, between the First and Second World War, when they were asked their identity, uh, used to reply with the, the Slavonic term Tuteshi, which means from here. Um, and this notion of from here is, and what determines the here that we're from, uh, I think is something that we really need to address um, and this is what something that, that ethnology along with geography has done quite well and quite in depth. But where do we go from there and what does it feed into? And 
what what I suggested at the time that it should lead into a kind of applied regional science in the sense that it should inform approaches like planning, for example, uh, whether that's urban planning or rural planning or general landscape planning or whatever. So into a, a knowledge of place, the description of place that feeds into an, an, a knowledge of place, a deeper knowledge of place than we begin with, hopefully. Uh, and then we apply a kind of a philosophical approach that draws on this wisdom that sits in places as a kind of cultural philosophy, the toposophy, the wisdom of place, as it were, uh, both in, in geographical, uh, graphical sense and in, in the logical sense. Um, and it was only when I was writing this uh, this lecture and the, the notes for this lecture that it occurred to me that this actually this tri, tripartite division corresponds to something else that is quite famous in the history of philosophy. And that's the, the triad of building, dwelling, thinking, Bauen, Wohnen, and Denken, which uh, the philosopher Martin Heidegger wrote a very famous essay about where the building corresponds to the topography, the building up a stock of knowledge, a stock of description. Uh, then we, we, we dwell, we, un, we begin to understand the specificity of place. Uh, and that's when we do the, the dwelling. And I played on that with the English uh, word root habit, habitat, habitus, uh, inhabit, and so on. Uh, and then we think, in a broader sense of thinking, we think about the place. So building, dwelling, thinking is there. And where does that lead us to? Hopefully, it should lead us to an approach that uh, involves the co-creation of place, community-based, drawing on and working with the community, rather than uh, this is partly where the ethic would have come in if we hadn't run out of time. Uh, rather than being academics that come in with our, with our ethic categories uh, and, and telling the community what's best for them, trying to work with the ethic categories of the community and, and uh, try and interpret the place and understand the place in, in, in their terms. And these terms will be different when we're dealing with people who are effectively displaced or, or who have replaced, displaced people as in the, the Mamel land. Um, now, most of what I've talked about here today is very strongly rural based, but uh, with clay, but I've, I've already touched on, on, on urban places. And urban places are a particular challenge for belonging in, in a land based sense because uh, when we talk of land, we think of the rural, we don't really think of the urban. Um, and that's something that, that's almost suggests that in an urban context, you can't belong, you can't be rooted, you can only be rooted in, in rural places. And much of the populist ideology that is around, especially on the right, goes in that direction and, and hankers back for a rural past that maybe never was. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of very critical of those approaches for all sorts of other reasons as well, but that's, uh, one food for thought or one one idea that we might want to explore and think about a bit more more that there are urban places that are places too uh, place rootedness identity isn't exclusively rural even though a lot of our thinking seems to be prefiguring and, 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 and connecting just with the rural and exclude the urban and i think that's a mistake so thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to talking about bits and pieces that come out of this. And I think we are now open for questions and comments, so please um, welcome if there are any questions. So, Professor, this is the time right now. Yeah, so maybe if I can ask a question, thank you so much for, uh, for, for your speech and for your um, uh, lecture. Um, I wanted to ask uh, maybe your comment on transnationalism. Uh, 
that you um, mentioned as euphemism for uh, for displaced people. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on this uh, critical approach uh, towards transnationalism. Well, I have uh, I gave a paper some some years ago in in Vilnius where I basically said that that I think tra transnationalism isn't a concept that seems to mean an awful lot. It's uh, a notion that was pioneered by people like Steve Bertovich in the context of doing some migration research and trying to get to grips with um, the life experience of people who, for want of a better term, live their lives in different places and in different nations and different national contexts. And um, that in itself is, is fine. It's, it's an empirical description of a state of being. Um, what happened then in, in the academic discourse, to my mind, and I haven't read everything on that, but for what I've read on it, uh, is that people went, this, this, this is how globalization has made us, and isn't it great that we're now all wonderful transnational beings that li live and move with ease in these different contexts? And it completely ignores the fact that a lot of people don't move with ease in these different contexts. And I had a PhD student. Um, from the Slovenia uh, in, in the early 2010s, um, who looked precisely at that and did it as outer ethnography as well and, and talked to other migrants, uh, Lithuanian migrants in, in Scotland. And the picture that was coming across was, yes, okay, we are all transnational in an empirical sense that we have one foot in, a foot in each country or something like that. Uh, but it, it, it wasn't, necessarily a, a happy and resolved and, and integrated experience. It was a, a very tense and, and fractured experience. And, and that isn't really captured in, in a lot of the academic discourse I find. find. Thank you so much. Any other questions, please? If there are some, uh, yeah, if there are some thinking to do, I have a question. Oh, sorry, Nikos, please, Nikos. Uh, I, I will give my question the next one, okay? <laughs> if I can. Yeah. Hello there. Uh, I was thinking about how to reconnect the city dwellers, as you said, uh, with the environment, and in a way to disconnect them from the church of uh, TikTok and other social networks that are quite quite the plague uh, right now the, are you asking I, I, I'm asking uh, about the uh, reconnection of, uh, uh, of uh, the of people to the environment to make the city people respect the environment much more. Mm. Because uh, I myself, I have <laughs> sinned that way, but, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to kind of uh, having a small garden and, and, and everything to just be more with the laws of the nature and and, mm -hmm. and uh, my surrounding environment. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are different approaches to that. And one is, of course, the, the example that I had of, of the shielding project, where you take people outside, outside of the urban context and introduce them to let's say a, re a remote or semi-remote rural context in order to help them reconnect with what is effectively a rural environment, a rural place belonging complex, if you want to call it that. Um, there are other approaches within cities. Um, and we, we live outside of Edinburgh and on the way into Edinburgh, we. Then, then we drive, we pass an urban farm, 
and urban farms are quite common in, in the UK. I don't know whether they're around in, in Latvia, but they're basically, they were set up as charities in order to bring urban kids in contact with the country without taking them out into the country. So there, there's that way of approach. And, and then there's more recently the, the, the ideas about guerrilla, guerrilla gardening. My pronunciation is bad there, but it's basically where people uh, take a piece of wasteland and turn it into a garden. That's usually a group initiative, and, and that, that, that's quite a, an interesting phenomenon in, in urban communities, in urban contexts, where people recreate a piece of nature, and sometimes they, they make themselves knowledgeable from books, and sometimes they make themselves knowledgeable by going out into the country for projects uh, to study and learn how one, one does the various bits and pieces about making the earth suitable for, for planting and, and all of that. But still, that is tied into a context of that contrasts the rural and the urban. And I think the, there is a challenge there for urban redevelopment that helps us developing sense, sense of place, attachment, relearning of traditional skills, etc., in an urban context, because it's not as if all of this only happens in the, in the rural and then the bad city comes along and destroys it all. The city is part of our human experience and that goes back quite a long time in history. Uh, what we don't know, like Hollywood movies don't tell us this, but in America before the white settlers arrived, there were cities. Native Americans had big cities, like not like New York, but tens of thousands of people living in cities there. Um, and these cities were integrated into their environment in a way our modern cities not necessarily are. So that, that's where the urban challenge really lies. Not to raise the cities that make turn them all into, into rural fields, but to um, create something that is in tune in keeping with the ecology of place. I'm extremely happy about that uh, we have a place in Riga where we can have urban gardens. And I do have one there. Uh, it's called Lutzavsala, and it's, it's, uh, uh, there's, there's a bunch of gardens split in, in, in multiple kind of uh, uh, neighborhoods. <laughs> and uh, it's, it was very, very messy, but we really um had a lot of work there and we we, we made a beach and we made a, 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 a greenhouse and a garden there and it's very very beautiful and you literally can't believe that 15 minutes uh, away you're in city and then you're in the garden at, at the beach by the river and it's uh it's uh, something that i wish everybody that's frustrated with the city life would would uh, enjoy at some time i mean that's this is the idea that was behind the garden city movement 100 years ago um, yeah. and that fed into the new town movement in the 70s but if you look at a lot of the new towns nowadays in some cases this idea worked really well and they, they've, they've created an integrated ecology of, of, of town and country and uh, it works really well whereas in other places they're absolutely terrible sites and, and uh, there's a lot of deprivation in these new towns as I'm talking from the British experience now. Um, then most of them are not very nice places to live nowadays despite the wonderful aspirations they have about fusing the best of both worlds as it were. And somewhere along the lines, it, it, it didn't happen. Whereas in, in, the, in the older garden strategy, garden, the garden city movement, they seem to have done better. And it's, it would be interesting to do a study of that. I don't know whether landscape architects have, have done that, but it would be interesting to do comparative studies of those two ways of, of, ways of, of, of doing city and country. And, and but why one work better than the other but uh, yeah, that's a ta uh, task for another day maybe thank you um, 
I, yeah, I think that um, this ur ur urban places, uh, if you are talking about identity and you talk that it's quite a challenging uh, question. I think that Lutzatala is one of the examples when we can talk about community-based identity in uh, urban places. And uh, yeah, Lutzatala and other these in take or gardening, these gardening communities, uh, they have their, uh, I think, own identity uh, and, and they are uh, joining and sharing uh, the knowledge. Uh, but uh, 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 you were talking about Kuronian speed and uh, it was really interesting for me uh, also. And then uh, I was thinking about that, um, Actually, the inhabitants of Kuronian speed, they uh, do this land-based learning and build actually Kuronian landscape. But uh, do they actually identify themselves with the Kuronians uh, who are, uh, uh, for me, as uh, saved by migration, uh, actually these Kuronian people. For example, uh, uh, some of them are live uh, in Sweden. Yeah, I mean, it's about 10 years since I was there. Um, but um, at the time, what was it? But a couple of things that were interesting was um, even though that the, the local population came from all over uh, Lithuania yeah. and, and even further afield, there was very few of the original pe uh, population left. Um, one of the interesting things that was happening was the Lutheran church in Nida mm -hmm. was re-consecrated and is being used again for services. Now it's still used for, for um, concerts and stuff, I think as well, but as churches are. But there, there was at the time a, a movement or an initiative going on to use the old songbooks now, the old songbooks are in German or low German. Oh, yeah. um, and you had a phenomenon that I encountered once as a, as a student in, in, in England with a Japanese uh, medical student who knocked on my door because he knew I was German and serenaded me with a German folk song. He didn't speak a word of German, but he had this songbook and he could sing this German song. And there was something of that happening at the, at, the, at the grassroots level. And that of course makes you wonder why do people do that? And the, the answer to the question was, this is part of our heritage. So um, uh, we're, we're dealing with the identity of this place and this place for nearly well, over a thousand years nearly was, was a, a German place and now it is no more. Um, so this is, our part of a way of, of honoring is perhaps the wrong word, but acknowledging this is as part of our past. Um, and maybe one or two of those people would have actually gone on and learned German. That's I don't know about that, but uh, I found that very interesting. And, and the other thing is that people have said, well, this is one of Europe's disputed territories in the sense that people were driven out and other people came in and so on. Um, we make this a center of reconciliation in a small way, big way. And the Thomas Mann house that uh, Thomas Mann built, uh, had a house built with his money that he got for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Uh, and that was developed into a European cultural center that uh, has quite an extensive program now of bringing people together across cultural boundaries and, and uh, projecting the, the region practically as, as, as one of those staging posts for the new Europe. Um, so our local, local, local identity uh, isn't rooted in the old sense. And this is where Kenneth White's thing comes in about new identities not being uh, rooted in the old sense. Uh, but we still want to be connected with the place. And this is the place, the kind of place connections that we're making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, worlds are multiple. I could add something. Sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, thank I, you. I was... oh, 
<laughs> Ulrich, thank you for a really enlightening presentation and just new concepts also coming up. Uh, I have two actually remarks. One, uh, considering uh, the Kronian speed, but I will start with the other, which uh, in the very beginning, you actually traced two North European regions in, in your presentation. One was Scottish Isles and actually the Northern European part, which is perhaps not considered as Northern European and also the Baltics. And what came to my mind is that um, a Latvian filmmaker Andris Slapinch, he was killed in 1991 by, uh, by Soviets, but anyway, he made uh, in 1988 a film, a documentary, uh, connecting the Baltic region, Latvia and Lithuania, with Scotland, uh, Scottish Isles actually, the isle, island of Bara, and also Wales, uh, tracing some traditional uh, connections, uh, traditional and also uh, uh, traditional skills together with the landscape. So very interesting film, Fields of Hope, Tseri Bulauk in Latvian, Fields of Hope. Uh, I think very interesting thing to explore just in the view of, of the theories you presented. And uh, a brief comment on the Koronian spit, um, which is actually really very interesting place. And I also agree with uh, Eva uh, asking uh, the question. But uh, another thing, which uh, we also did some research there. And um, what is very interesting that uh, in 1950s, Koronian spit, which was emptied uh, in the late 1940s, or cleared, how did you say it? Uh, but then it was re, mm, uh, re well, some population, uh, uh, repopulated from areas which are quite distant from there. And we did some research on the people who arrived there. For instance, they arrived from forest places in Southern Lithuania, they didn't, didn't know the local wisdom connected to the place of Koronian spit, the proximity of the sea and the lagoon, very specific natural conditions, place names, everything. They didn't know this and they couldn't adopt to mm, that place. Uh, they had so different um, cultural uh, baggage, so they really it took tens of years, decades to adopt to the local place, but somehow they managed as well. But it's very interesting also to study such things. Yes, and, and, and especially like what, what I ref, refer to as, as, the, as the displaced in the new places. Uh, you have in, in that situation, there is a certain inevitable pressure on, on, on you to either throw down roots or stay alienated as it were. Um, and very often that happens only in the second generation, but sometimes it, it happens earlier already, but uh, very often it's the second and third generation really that, that finds its roots in a, in a new place and, 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 and discovers. I mean, one of, one of the people that we, we talked to at the time uh, was actually, so she, like a local historian almost, um, who, who, who really had, it, had, the, had the new place so soaked up in, into, into her being, as it were, uh, that she was teaching her contemporaries as, as were about all these uh, historical knowledges and wisdoms, and especially the ecological knowledge about the the dune and how it how that impacts on on people's lives and uh, and all of that. So uh, that, that film that you mentioned is is, is quite an interesting uh, one that I must follow up because there, there certainly is a connection with the Baltics uh, that I wasn't even aware of when many years ago when my mother died and we got rid of some of the books because we couldn't bring them all. Uh, there was two books there about. The Baring family, by written by a guy called William Simpson, who doesn't sound like a Latvian name to you, possibly, but he actually was Latvian. 
uh, and he, dis he descended from a Scottish family that lived in a manor house. And he wrote the, the story of the, in, in a Latvian manor house. And he wrote the story of that family in three volumes. Um, and this is one of the books that went to the library. I wish we had kept it because it was kind of a window into that uh, world that is no longer there of, of pre, not pre-war, but interwar. So the first, the first, the, the first Latvia, so the, the Republic 1920 to, to 39. So that, that would have been quite an interesting insight, but that gave me a, a clue to the, the connections between the Baltic area, more broadly speaking, and Scotland. And there's quite a lot there. And some of our colleagues in, in UHI are actually working on that, especially in the early modern period. I know there was a Scots Quarter in Klaipeda, for example. Um, it's at one point I go back and I do a bit of research on, but uh, there must be something in, in Riga probably as well. And obviously that was tied into the, in the, into the early modern period, the decline of the Hanseatic League and the Scottish merchants and all of that, but that's a topic for another day. And folklore collection also is connected, uh, the connection between Scotland and and Riga, and also the Riga architect, John Armitstead, <laughs> also is a good connection between Scotland. Yes, I put the name of the film in, in the chat so you can see it and maybe... Oh yeah, Huntress. I suppose this isn't available on DVD these days. Uh, Maybe it's a download. There might be some problems because his films somehow they um, because of copyrights, which are a bit strange. Um, we tried to find them uh, some of of his films, but I don't know if this will be available. But I shall see. Perhaps if I have something, I can make you know about it. Thank you so much, Valdis. Um... Are there any other questions? Because we are actually running out of the time right now, and we have to close down the close the, down our I guess lecture right now. And um, I will be very really teasing right now somebody for the questions. So the last question to to ask our professor. Okay. Um, if there are any, not any questions yet, then uh, probably I will say thank you so much to uh, Professor Ulrich Kapla for today's uh, presentation and for all participants for your very uh, delightful yes, listening and all the questions and discussion at the end. As always, time is uh, our privilege in a way. Therefore, probably we'll meet next time in another guest lecture and please follow the, all the news about our project that is, uh, as I mentioned, done together with four, five, actually five universities in Latvia. So we will meet next time in um, Identities of the Landscapes again. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. See you soon. Thank you.